Just a little bit of background. Situational Game Design is a, uh, a book that I wrote. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what's in it and why you might be interested in using it in an academic setting. Uh, myself, I've been in the industry for um, uh, over 20 years. Uh, I'm currently the chief creative officer at a, a little startup called um, Croquet Studios. Um, if you've tried to reach me to do consulting work when I was freelancing, I'm very sorry that I haven't responded because we're starting a new studio and it's been crazy. So, in order to explain why situational game design exists, I first have to explain a bit about my first book, The Aesthetic of Play. Um, I wrote The Aesthetic of Play because I was troubled that my own thoughts about how game design worked weren't really reflected in what I was um, um, seeing in the existing literature and the existing way people were talking about things. And I wanted to basically lay out my own philosophy for how to design games and what the meaning of play is. Um, as a book, it's an argument. It's an argument for a particular stance with relationship to play and towards, uh, toward game design, but it's not really a teaching text. It was designed more as a, a, a polemic to convince people to think about play in certain ways. So this was a problem because then uh, I was approached a couple of years ago by Brenda Romero who said, essentially, I want to use your, uh, your book to teach my undergrad class on game design. And I was very flattered, but my response was, uh, I don't think that's a very good idea. Uh, the reason why is because it, it really wasn't geared toward an undergrad audience. It was a whole bunch of really weird esoteric theory about why I think I'm right, and not really anything about a practical methodology for um, how to, uh, um, how to uh, actually make games using the techniques I was laying out. So as a result, um, being a good friend, I decided to write a book for her. Um, and I, that wasn't the only reason, but I, I wanted to um, take the ideas that I'd put forth in the aesthetic of play and try to turn it into something that could actually be used um, both by undergrads and also by working designers. So it's not like you, you're not this is not something where you're trying to be convinced. This is like, here is a methodology that you can use to analyze games and to design games. And so that's basically what I'm gonna talk about. One of the things that prompted me to do this talk is because I gave a, a, a smaller talk on this subject at uh, uh, USC uh, last fall as part of their Playthink um, series. And I discovered that they had actually adopted um, situational game design as one of their texts. And I thought, well, yeah, if USC likes it, then maybe other people would like it as well. And so maybe I could talk a little about it and people could see if they were interested and it would be useful for their own game design programs. So in order to describe what situational game design is, I should first start with what, I, what we normally think of as game design and which, what I call transactional game design. And in transactional game design, we tend to focus on what the game does. Um, we focus on the affordances that the game offers to the player, and we focus on the sort of the interactions that, that can occur. Um, we think of play in transactional terms as being something that happens on the interface between player and game. So the game lets you do certain things, and in doing them, you are playing. Uh, it's focused on getting good interactivity, having good feedback loops, making sure that interface that exists between the player and the game is really crunchy and chewy and satisfying and wonderful because that's where all the play lives. Um, so as a result, it, it, it's focused on how do we design the game. It's very game-centric, but it's also um, player agnostic. It kind of assumes that a good game is a good game for everybody and that um, games sort of exist uh, as platonic ideals rather than in something that is, they're actually played by specific players with, with their own specific agendas. In contrast, uh, situational design is extremely player-centric. Um, and thinking about how um, I approach my own um, game designs, um, I don't think of the game as being something that stands apart from the player. I think of the game as actually being something that exists as, as a fusion of a, an external rule set, an external set of constraints, 
and the internal set of, of, of predispositions and attitudes and strategies that the player brings to the table. Play, in that case, is not centered on the interface between game and player, but play is centered in the mind of the player um, themselves. And so, as a result, it allows you to analyze certain things that are a little hard if you think about everything being about interactivity. So, for example, you can think about what happens um, when the player is holding very still and not actually interacting with the game, but is still enjoying themselves. You can think about in a turn-based game, what's going on in the off-turn experience, where you're waiting for somebody else to move, but you're still actively engaged, engaged in gameplay. You can think about the ways that uh, it can be playful to experience a narrative or to experience an emotional moment in the game. And so as a result, um, whereas transactional game design is useful for certain sorts of very interactive heavy games, um, situational game design gives you a set of tools that you can use to analyze these other sorts of experiences that we don't often think of as gameplay, but are still very, very playful. And so it, it's player-centric and also, as I'm going to explain in a little bit, um, what I call a constraint agnostic. And I'm going to explain that on the very next slide. So what is a constraint? Constraints are central to the notion of situational game design. Um, constraints are anything that limits player action from moment to moment. Um, so you know, in most games, uh, you know, a rule is obviously a constraint. But things like um, the layout of a play field are a constraint. So the bounciness of a soccer ball is a constraint on how um, soccer is played. The layout of a level on a first-person shooter is a, is a constraint on how it's played. And even things that we don't usually think of as being in-game are also constraints. So the physicality of a, of a controller that you hold in your hands is also a constraint on the sorts of ways you can play, which is why that you, know, you have a very different play experience if you're playing with mouse and keyboard or if you're playing with uh, a, a console controller. But there's some other things beyond this that also count as constraints. And these are things that exist in the mind of the player. These are things like genre expectations. So if you're playing a first person shooter, you have certain assumptions that you bring to the game that stand outside of the system of constraints that the game itself imposes on you. Um, you may have strategies that you adopt. You may know that doing certain things is a bad idea and so you don't do them. That counts as a constraint. Um, certain games are more fun if you, know, um, if you know a lot about how to play them. So you, if you have a very steep learning curve, it might be like, well, this is really boring and frustrating. Oh, but once you know everything about it, then it's interesting because you have the right strategic constraints in order to make something interesting to play. And things that like narrative flow or your sense of characterization, who, it's, who it is you're playing. You know, if you're playing somebody who is a hero, you may actually choose different actions while you're playing than if you, you're playing somebody who you think of as a villain. And finally, um, there are all sorts of, of um, what I call um, per, um, perversions or misunderstandings. Because the game you play is often not the game that is imposed upon you, the game that, that has been designed, but the game that you think you're playing. Um, if you don't know certain things, or certain features uh, uh, exist within the game, then you won't actually use those features. They won't become part of the constraint space that describes how it plays. Or you may willfully decide to, um, uh, to ignore them. So for example, you, you may per play in perverse ways. Um, years ago when I was playing a lot of Doom, a group of us got together and tried to see how big of a human pyramid we can build in Doom. Um, it was a complete perverse, perversity of how um, Doom was supposed to be played, but by imposing our own unusual and very strange constraints, we actually had a really good time with it. And so there may be all sorts of um, ways that you can play within a game's play space that are not um, constrained by the actual rules or built-in constraints of the game. So constraints um, are what define what I call a situation. A situation is a relatively stable set of constraints. It is a, a, a place you find yourself in playing the game where the constraints around you are not changing very much. Now, by relatively stable, I mean you know within the within the um, st st uh, stable within the um, the context of like a fraction of a second when you're actually making your gameplay decisions. 
So if it's, tur if it's a turn-based game, your constraints may be you know, stable for you know, um, several minutes, but it's a fast-paced action game, your constraints may be relatively stable for you know, a few milliseconds. But in any case, it, it gives you a way to get at the moment-to-moment uh, um, -moment experience and form a model of something that's stable that you can analyze. So uh, a situation is composed of, of constraints, and then within a, a situation you have moves. Moves are things that you can do in a situation. There are, there are things that are allowed to you by um, the constraints. And then finally, what makes a move a move is that a move is something that changes your constraints. So that every gameplay experience or every play experience can be understood as a continual motion through this cycle, where you have a set of constraints that structure a situation, Within that situation, you have a set of moves. You pick one of those moves that changes the set of constraints, and now you're in a new situation. And this gives us a way to have a theoretical model of what is happening moment to moment in the mind of the player as they're moving forward through a game. So anything that changes the constraints is a, is a move. Uh, pressing a button on a controller obviously is a move. But many moves can happen entirely inside the player's head. So if you're um, um, playing a game like Portal and you're standing staring at a, 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 a puzzle room that has a, a bunch of different um, possible solutions, you're actively engaged, you're actively working through a set of moves, but the moves that you're working through are not ones that you're making in the game, in the, in the, the, the external game, they're moves that you're making entirely in your head. You're moving from one situation to another, one internal situation to another within your, within your own mind, and what makes a puzzle game like this interesting is the way these internal situations are structured so that is you're moving from, from one, considering one possibility to another, you have um, um, the right number of possible permutations of, of, of moves that you can select in order to, uh, in order to move forward. So what this gives us the notion of the situation gives us a way to uh, conceptualize the moment-to-moment -moment experience of playing a game. And it gives us a way to analyze this experience so that if you have a, a student who's designing a game and they're, they're not sure why something isn't working properly, or you try to do a critique of a game, you're like, yeah, I, I'm playing this and it's just not fun. W what's wrong here? Breaking things down into situations and trying to understand the situations it's structuring can often give you these answers. So in any moment, you can say, okay, what constraints are the, is the player actually operating under here? What are the limitations in the player's behavior? And what assumptions might I be making about limitations in the player's behavior that um, I am not taking into account? You know, is this game boring because the players have discovered master strategies that have, that have eliminated all their choices? Um, is it frustrating because they don't know the things they need to know? Trying to identify um, the constraints that exist in a situation can often give you a way to analyze whether it, it is working or not as a play experience. And th then knowing what moves you can make as results. You know, so so the, the, no, recognizing in a situation the tensions that exist between, between moves and, uh, and constraints can ha help answer game design questions. So once you look at a situation, um, what I also provide is a set of, of uh, heuristics or rules for determining whether a situation should theoretically be playable or not, or playful or not. Um, this is a set of, of uh, general principles for what makes situations interesting for us to be in. Um, and it, it's broken down into, in, into um, uh, six different heuristics. Um, I, uh, if you want to know them in more detail, I don't have time to really go into them in, in, in a lot of detail, but I can explain briefly um, what, the, uh, what the theory behind it is. Um, we like situations where we have a handful of moves, where we have three to seven different possibilities that are meaningful to choose between. Um, if we don't have enough, a game feels boring, and if we have too many, a game feels confusing. And so when you're looking at situations, you think, you know, what are the meaningful moves that a player can make here, and do I, do I give them too many or too few? Situations also can't repeat. You need to have um, uh, situations that, you need to be con continually encountering new situations. The reason for this is because um, your memory of your previous, um, the, uh, of a previous move you make within a situation um, affects 
your, it becomes a constraint upon your new moves. So if you encounter the same situation over and over again and you've already picked a move that you like um, and you're happy with it, you will automatically pick that move. And now this new constraint, your knowledge of what you've done before, um, reduces the number of moves from what might have been an interesting number the first time you encountered it into just a single move and the situation becomes boring. This, the moves need to have consequences. Uh, this is kind of baked into the definition for moves. Um, moves need to change the, the, the constraints. If a move does not take you to a new situation, if, if it feels empty or pointless, then um, the, you're, you're sort of by default are repeating the same situation over and over again. That makes it less interesting. Um, they need to be predictable. Um, when we choose moves, we need to have a reason to choose one move over another. We need to feel like we are accomplishing something when we choose moves in a situation. And in order for that to happen, the move has to be predictable. We have to be able to run through a chain of possible moves in our head and see that it might probably arrive at a, at a future situation that we find desirable. Um, whether because it leads us towards winning or because it answers some question we have about the game or because it allows us to perform some role um, within, our, um, within the make-believe that we have of the game. We want to be able to, we want to feel like our moves have consequence and that, that we, we can determine what those consequences are. But at the same time, um, they can't be too predictable. We can't be absolutely sure that the moves we make in a situation will give us the result we want because otherwise we can run through future situations in, in our head. This is the mirror of, of having um, situations that um, get played out because we encounter the same situation over and over again. If I'm able to run through a long chain of situations um, by imagining all the moves that I'm going to make, um, then in, it becomes boring when I actually get around to making those moves. I've already made the choices in advance and I've already taken, um, I've already, already used up all of the fun. Uh, this is an example where, you know, in, in a chess game where um, the, the end of a game is a foregone conclusion, someone may say something like mate in three. Well, there's no point in actually playing because everybody knows how it's going to go and at that point, um, there is no more play left in the, uh, in the, uh, the situations that you'll be encountering. And finally is satisfaction. Um, it, it's not enough to know where you're going, but you want to be able to, um, to, to pick moves that, that lead you at least in, in, in that offer the, uh, the possibility of success. So um, you, know, you, want to, you want to be able to choose moves that you think will help you win or that will give you some other reward as um, either uh, um, um, personal or internal as you're playing the game. So in order for all this to work, you really need to come into this thinking about who's your player, and not who's your player in the very vague um, sort of, um, um, oh, we're targeting the action, uh, the action adventure demographic, or you know, we, we are intended this, we're intending this to be about, um, the, uh, about um, fans of fighting games. Um, you need to try to get yourself into the mind of the player and think through themselves through what sort of constraints they might be bringing to the table, so that um, different people from different backgrounds, from uh, different ages, different ethnicities, different genders, people will bring different pre-existing constraints to the game. And so, um, when you're thinking about uh, assembling a set of constraints that will offer interesting situations, a lot of times what you need to do is be thinking, okay, what assumptions am I making about the player? Um, no game exists entirely with, um, with it, that is entirely self-contained. Con, um, we all make assumptions when we're designing games that players will bring certain pre-existing constraints. Um, sometimes these constraints are drawn entirely from the real world. So if you make a driving game, you kind of assume that even if people don't know how to drive, they know in general what driving is and what the rules of the road are. And so um, you know, uh, simulation games rely heavily on people having a sense of what they're supposed to be doing before they start to play. And so um, when you think about how to design games using situational game design, a big part of it is thinking about you know, who is going to be playing it and how are they going to change as they're playing. So you know, this is kind of reiterating what I just said, but play is the intersection between a well-designed game and a suitable player. We create sets of rules, we create the game as designed, and then the player brings their own internal constraints um, both that, that they had previously and their understanding of the game, and it is the intersection of those two that produces the play space where play emerges. But more importantly, this is not a static system. Games will change us as we play them. So um, as you are playing a game, you are constantly developing new constraints 
based upon what you're learning from playing the game. You have new ways of understanding the game, you have new strategies you're developing, you try something out and it fails, you're like, oh, that, that was wrong, I shouldn't do that. And so when we're thinking about designing these, these constraints, it's not, we're not just designing for one assumed player, we're designing for an assumed player who's going to be evolving through time in response to the problems that we were posing for them. So in, in many ways we can think about that if somebody is really into a game, and if you, if, you're, if, you're, if, you, if you don't just abandon a game because you're not interested in it, then what happens is that you are becoming the player that you need to be in order to play through a game. And that gives us a very powerful tool for thinking about how games can actually affect and influence people. So, we talk, this is another advantage of situational game design, is it gives us a really concrete way to get at what games mean. Meaning is not what a game tells us. It is not a didactic exercise in a game instructing us. Meaning is the residue of the experience that we have while we play the game. Meaning is what, what, we, have lear, is, meaning is what we have learned to be in order to successfully play the game. And so that games that are very, very meaningful to us are games that reinforce particular patterns of behavior that then linger with us afterwards. They give us ways of being in a playful world where we were rewarded for, um, for um, adopting certain attitudes and certain strategies. And then those attitudes and strategies persist after they're gone. They are the residue of, of the play experience. So really quickly, because I only have half an hour and I want to have a little time for questions. So there, you can think about how we put this all together in order to um, have a coherent model for designing games within this. Um, and this is, this, is sort of, this is how I approach it. I start off with an intended experience. I, there is something I want players to, to feel, some, some way I want them to be within the games that I am creating. And then that way of being within the world will lead to a set of performative moves because since meaning is the residue of experience, the, the experience I wanted to live is, is composed of performative actions that, that they will perform in the context of the game. These performative actions will emerge out of situations so that if I want to create particular, uh, particular actions that give a particular feeling to a game, I need to design situations that are going to uh, make those actions emerge naturally and fluidly. Where I, where I wanted those actions, I'm not, I'm not doing because I'm told to, but because that's what it seems natural to do. And then the design of those situations is constrained by the heuristics of play so that uh, in order to keep people engaged in making the, the, these, uh, these performative moves, we need to structure situations that from moment to moment will keep them continually engaged. The need to have these situations gives us an idea of what sort of constraints we need to have. What are the limitations that we put on the player? And in particular, how do we, what assumptions do we make about what the player already has as constraints? And what, can, what is the minimal amount of constraints that we can add to what they already have to structure these sort of playful situations? And finally, the need to generate these, these, these constraints gives us um, a, a way to get at the game system. So that the system we're creating is step-by-step um, um, step, um, produced from the experiences we are, in, we are intending to uh, evoke in the player. We are creating a system that will, have, that will contain constraints, that will interact with the constraints that the player already has, that will structure the situations we want, that will be playful in a way, that will keep the player engaged, and as a result of that, they'll have a set of performative moves that will reinforce certain um, either understandings or strategies within the player that will linger with them after the game is over and gives us a way to actually convey something meaningful, hopefully, um, um, to players who are part of receptive audiences. Uh, thank you very much. That's, um, uh, that's it in a nutshell. Um, it's kind of hard to summarize a, um, an entire book in, in 25 minutes, but, uh, and there's, there, there's, a, there's a whole lot more in the book about designing goals and anticipation and how this all ties into narrative, but um, this at least gives you a background and gives you a sense of whether this might be something that you're at all interested in. And so now, if, if there are questions, um, there is a microphone, and um, these lights are in my eyes, and I have no idea if anybody actually goes to it or not, so. Um. Uh, hello? Yes, hey. I could I, I could kind of see you. Okay, cool. Um, so where I teach, uh, Breda University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands, um, we are very much focused on what you described as the transactional model at the start there. 
And then after a couple of projects, we jump straight to, uh, we're very focused on like the Ubisoft rational game design, really deep dive, like what are your parameters, what are your variables kind of approach. Um, do you have any experience with that Ubisoft kind of model or that kind of level of work? Not really, because I, um, I've kind of been designing this way for my entire professional career. Okay. okay. <laughs> so. Okay, yeah. it, just, it sounds very much like this sits between those two concepts, and we have noticed we have a gap there, so this is really interesting. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, actually, I'm supposed to repeat the questions. The, the question was whether this ties in at all with uh, um, Ubisoft's model of um, a rational game design. Okay. Um, yep, thank you. Sure. Uh, is there anybody else? I think that may be it then. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, uh, enjoy the rest of the session, or, or the rest of the show. Thank you.